Gary's place. Let's all stand to our feet.
glad you're here this morning. many are thankful to be pulled out of a pit and have their sins paid for by King Jesus. Amen. We give him praise. We give him worship today. And hey, you know what? Sometimes we might be tempted to take for granted all the, the talent and the love and the energy that's poured out here on this stage. Volunteers coming together to give their best to lead you in worship. Let's just say thank you to our band too. Go ahead and have a seat. Glad you're here. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name's Clay. I'm one of the pastors here. And we are just so glad to be here as a family, a church family, to worship together. If you're new, 
we want to especially welcome you and invite you to, to let us know you're here. We'd like to connect with you in some way. You could scan the uh, code up here on the screen with your phone or and or you can go out to the Orange Connect Center out here at the end of the plaza. We have a gift for you there and also information and can answer questions. And again, welcome. Uh, anybody ready for Christmas? Well, some of you would get along well with my wife who uh, has already been playing some Christmas music, instrumental, fortunately, so far. But I, I, this, even this morning, I'm like, was that Christmas music? Like, uh, can we wait till after Thanksgiving? No, you should know that. You've been married for almost 41 years. Well, we have a Christmas tree out in the lobby today, not because we're skipping Thanksgiving, but because there's a very strategic purpose for that tree out there. We're partnering again with the Birthed Life Center, operated by the House of Neighborly Services, which meets in our outpost building on Tuesdays and Thursdays, serving those with needs in our community. And so if you wanna grab one of those names on the tree, there's, an, there's a name and there's an age, or I don't know if there's a name, but there's a child, uh, uh, gender and an age. Is that right? Okay, anyway, what you do is you just take it and whatever it says on it, you go and buy some presents. And if you have any questions about what kind of presents would be good, you can talk to those that are uh, by the tree out there. And then you'll bring those back. Don't wrap them because we're going to allow parents to come. They're going to allow parents to come and select for their children from what we collect. So uh, you guys are always so generous to be a part of this. And we encourage you to do that again this year as we prepare for the holidays. And thank you in advance. Thank you also for your partnership in serving and giving through the local church. We always say you give through Grace Place, not to Grace Place. And uh, that enables us to do the ministry both inside and outside the walls that we're all part of it. We're all a team. You're, if you are a regular person here at Grace Place, you're part of the Grace Place staff. We got paid and unpaid staff. And so we thank you for being a part of that group. There's the three ways that you can give. And we... Um, do this, many of us, as a discipline, as an act of worship, as an act of obedience. And uh, so thank you for being a part of that team. I'm excited today to introduce our speaker. We really believe that God has moved supernaturally to help us find a new youth pastor when we um, got the news that we were needing to make a transition with our youth ministry. And uh, our speaker today is our new youth pastor. Ron Waterman has been uh, given an interesting platform because of his background. Some of you know he was uh, very successful with a career in the, in the ring, the MMA, and then with the worldwide wrestling uh, group. And as a result of that, he becoming a Christian in his early 30s, was able to use that platform to have a testimony for Jesus. A recent documentary called Where Are They Now just came out. I just posted a link on my Facebook yesterday page. And it's about Ron. And what I love about it is it's a professional crew came. In fact, they were here at church and there's scenes from Grace Place in the documentary. But they went ahead and just from beginning to end allowed him to share his testimony as well as showing clips from his past. And so he was with Team Impact for a number of years. And that's a bunch of Christians who are strong men who went around and went into schools and did feats of strength and then invited people to churches to hear their testimony. And thousands have come to, to faith as a result of Ron and that team's ministry. And uh, Ron was ordained about 10 years ago by Team Impact at a church in Dallas by the founder of Team Impact. And uh, But this is his first opportunity, even though he's thought about and prayed about it a lot, to be a local church pastor as opposed to a traveling evangelist. And uh, so we're excited. He kicked off last Sunday night with our students and we'll continue tonight, but he's going to bring the message this morning. So please give a warm welcome to Ron Waterman. Well, I am real excited to get to share with you guys this morning. Pastor Clay touched on this a little bit, but 
over the last 20 years, I've got to step into a lot of different churches, um, hundreds and hundreds, and I hear uh, the worship teams and stuff, and I don't think that we realize how fortunate we really are to have Jeremy and Zane in this group up here. Give these guys one more big round of applause. They truly are amazing, and it's, it's a blessing to get to come and, wor and to worship with them. Let's open up in a word of prayer this morning. Lord, I want to thank you for this opportunity to share your word this morning. I pray that you would open our hearts to the Holy Spirit, that the gospel message shared this morning would be received and applied to all of our lives. We give you all the praise and all the glory, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, I'm going to share with you today out of the book of Mark, Mark 2. So if you brought your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 2 this morning if you want to pull it up on your phones, your tablets, but we're also going to have it up here on the screen. So you can follow along with me. The title of this message this morning is Holding the Rope, the rope and it's when Jesus heals a paralytic. Some of you have probably read this story, but I don't know about you, but when I read uh, the word, oftentimes I like to, to really think about what these guys were going through at the time, uh, what the word's trying to tell us. And a lot of times he'll place different things on my heart. I could read the same scripture three or four times, but I get a different meaning out of it. So hopefully that'll happen with you this morning. But I want you to really think about these words as I read through this with you. Mark chapter two, it says a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. He said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I love this story about these four guys, and like I was telling you earlier, I like to put myself in the place of these four guys and try to picture what they were going through and the emotions that they were feeling and, and try to put myself in this spot. I think about these four guys and how desperate they were to get this friend of theirs close to Jesus, and I often think about myself and I put myself, you know, Man, these are, these are four good friends. It doesn't really say in the story how far away that they had to carry this, this uh, handicapped man. Um, I'm a firefighter, and we do this thing oftentimes where it's called a dummy drag, and you get up underneath a person, 185 pounds, and, you, and it's just dead weight, and you're trying to carry them. And we have to carry them about 100 yards, and by the end of that 100 yards, you are just exhausted. You are really tired. And I'm sure that this wasn't just the house next door. They might have had to take this, uh, this handicapped man a long distance to get him to the house where Jesus was talking this day. So I can imagine by the time that they arrived at this house, they were pretty worn out. They were pretty tired. And then they get there and they look and they see that the crowds have already gathered. They're kind of late getting to this event. There's no way that they're going to be able to get into the door. And I'm just thinking, these guys were really desperate to get their friend close to Jesus. So he, they weren't going to give up. They weren't going to turn around, especially after taking him all this distance, turn around and take him all the way back. Sometimes we get to there and I'm sure they're thinking, you know what? God closed this door. Forget it. We're just going to 
We're just going to leave it alone and we'll try again some other time. But not these four guys. These four guys were dedicated. They were going to do whatever it took to get their friend close to Jesus. I think about the people that probably came to that event that day. There was probably a lot of just looky-loos that were curious. Jesus is coming back into his hometown. He's, you know, maybe they wanted to see, they've heard about some of the miracles that he'd been performing at the time. Um, they heard the stories. A lot of them were probably friends with Jesus because he's returning back to his hometown. They might have known him before he started his ministry. There was probably others in that crowd that were followers of Jesus. They'd been following for some time and they followed him back to his hometown and they were just anxious to hear every time that, that Jesus spoke. They wanted to hear what he was going to say. But then there was other religious leaders at the time and the Pharisees that were also, I'm sure at this place, the story actually tells us that they were, and I can imagine as I'm thinking about this story, I mean, I'm picturing these Pharisees and these religious leaders, they're there just trying to catch Jesus slipping up, doing something he wasn't supposed to do, maybe healing on the Sabbath, maybe saying something that he wasn't supposed to say. Modern day times, they probably were the guys in the corner with their phones out hitting record and, and recording it all so that they could prove him wrong. But I can see these guys and they were just hoping to catch Jesus trying to break the law. As I told you, I've been to hundreds and hundreds of church over the, over the last 20 years. And there are churches across America that operate under these same legalistic principles. They make these man-made regulations that say, if you don't look the right way, you're not welcome to come into our church. If you don't dress the right way, if you have tattoos or piercings, maybe you're in a, a same-sex relationship. And we prevent those that most need to be close to Jesus from stepping in the doors of our church. I want to tell you, over the last three years that I've been a member of this church, I've never once felt that way. But it's sad to think that there's people in the church that prevent those that most need to be close to Jesus from coming to church. I want you to know that the Bible tells us that we're all to be fishers of men, not cleaners of the fish. We just want to get people close to Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do his job and do the cleaning. As I told you at Grace Place, I've, I think you'd have a hard time finding anyone that's a guest to this church that felt unwelcome. I remember the first time coming into this church, I'm greeted by guys out there that are going out of their way to come up and shake my hand, toss a football to me. Uh, sometimes I'm even greeted with a hug. How many huggers are out there? I love getting hug, giving hugs. Wasn't COVID terrible on us huggers? <laughs> Man, it was the worst. The whole six feet rule. And then when some people did break the six feet rule, you got the little elbow bump. Man, it was terrible. It's painful. But you know what? I've, I've never seen this once. I've never seen this happen once at Grace Place. It's just not the environment that we have here. And I, and I love that. As the new youth pastor, um, right away as I joined the youth ministry, I saw the number of volunteers that we had in the ministry, um, their dedication, their commitment to these kids, and the love that they've shown the kids has absolutely been amazing. And it's so good for me as, as the leader of this group now to get to, to work with these people. And if you have a person that's a, a young child that's in youth ministry right now, man, you need to be assured that they are in good hands because we've got a great group of leaders. I want you guys to do me a favor. If you serve in any capacity here at Grace Place, would you just stand up real quick? Any capacity. Let's give them a big round of applause. Man, well-deserving. A successful church isn't led by the group of pastors that are in this church. It's by all of you people that have taken on leadership positions and, and joined serving teams, and there's so many different ways to serve at this church. Um, you can do so many different things to get involved in the church, and I can't list all of them. We can do, um, you know, we're going to have an opportunity right after the services today. We're going to have a table set up to sign up for winter camp. 
man, having your kids ask the friend to, to come out there and, and join winter camp with them and, and spend three days would be an amazing way to get, your pe- to get others close to Jesus. Um, joining a, a brotherhood or a beloved table, inviting friends to those tables, man, what a great way that you can get people close to Jesus. But I want you to think for a second about different ways that God's given you talents and abilities and what can you do to help get people closer to Jesus? It might be just inviting friends to the Christmas kickoff we have coming up at the beginning of December. Uh, what a great event. Uh, they're going to be surrounded by a bunch of believers. And think of all the different ways that you can get people into these church stores. Maybe it's just coming to a Sunday morning service. I know that that's what helped me when I made that decision in my life. My father finally talked me into coming to a Sunday morning service. And I felt God's presence for the first time in my life. And it changed my life forever. So sometimes it's the hardest people that we, that we think um, that, that make it difficult sometimes for us to, to reach out and say, man, but you never know. And I'll tell you another thing real quick is your testimony. No one else has your testimony. And somebody needs to hear that testimony. And you being able to share what God's done in your life, you don't need to know the Bible backwards and forwards, but you have your own testimony. And that testimony is a powerful tool to win others to Jesus. Use that testimony. Well, I'm going to go back into the Word a little bit here, and I want to talk about these four guys. These four guys that were desperate to get their friend close to Jesus. Their friend was probably a paraplegic or a quadriplegic, probably the latter. And they carried him all the way to this event. They get there, and they find out that where Jesus is speaking, there's a huge crowd. There's a lot of people there. And I'm trying to picture in my mind, maybe it's like showing up 20 minutes late to a Blake Shelton concert. And man, there's no way, there's no way you're going to get to the front of that stage, much less get on the stage and get close to Blake. But they get to the, the, the party a little bit late and they've got their friend, they're tired, they're worn out, but you know what? These guys aren't going to stop. So immediately when they, they get to this, they start to brainstorm and they start to think, man, what can I do? What can we do to get our friend close to Jesus. And I can just see the four of them there thinking to themselves, and one of them comes up with a great idea. Well, why don't we just get up on the roof? We'll get our friend up on the roof. And the story doesn't tell us how that happened. I'm not sure if it was a, a ladder, but even if it was a ladder, putting, putting a, a big man on your shoulders and climbing up a ladder, getting him up to the roof is no easy task. But I picture these guys and they're thinking, wow, why don't we just see if we can get him up on the roof? But then there's a whole new set of problems is how do they know where Jesus is inside the the house and how are they going to lower him right down above Jesus where he's going to be? It's not like in my profession as a firefighter where I can just cut a bunch of little holes with a nice handy saw and look down in there and see where they are below. And it also says that they had to dig through the roof. So a lot of those houses back in the day were made of mud and I can imagine it wasn't just an easy little, you know, we're going to tear out a nice little eight by four section and lower our friend down. They had to dig through this roof. So after they get their friend up on top of the roof, they've got to find out where Jesus is, dig through the roof, put their friend on this mat, cut holes in all four corners of the mat, attach ropes that are going to be long enough and right over the spot that Jesus is going to be, hold onto that rope and lower him at the same time until they can get him close enough to get to Jesus. Man, It makes me wonder, why would these guys go to this much trouble? Why would they go to this much work? Get to the place, climb up on the roof, dig a hole in the roof, attach the ropes, put their friend on there, lower him down, and get him close to Jesus. Well, here's why. You see that they knew that there was no doctor that they could take their friend to. There was no prescription that they could write. There was no surgeon they could take him to to heal him. They knew they couldn't fix their friend. They knew that this was their only hope. A lot of times I think about those four friends and I think about a lot of times in my life that I wish that I had friends like that. But it also makes me think of what kind of friend am I to the people that I surround myself with? Would I be willing to go to the extent that these four guys are going for their friend? And I like to put myself in the place of those four guys. You see, sometimes we all 
need people to carry us to the feet of Jesus in our lives. And we need to be that person for our friends as well. Well, I want to talk about verse 5 a little bit. We'll put verse 5 back up there on the screen. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, it's kind of interesting as we read that, that first one, that verse 5, because I can picture these four guys again standing around. They're, they're holding that rope as, as hard as they can and as tight. And all of a sudden, Jesus looks at the, the man. He got their attention. And he looks over at him and said, son, your sins are forgiven. And I could just see one of the guys saying, what did he just say? And the other guy says, I think he said something about sins. And the other guy says, well, did he say anything about healing? I'm sure these guys didn't expect that they were going to have to haul their, their friend back up on this rope and carry him all the way back home. So when he said, your sins are forgiven, I'm sure that they were a little bit confused and maybe a little bit baffled at the time. You know, sometimes God overlooks what we want to give us what we need. And God knew ahead of time that this man needed his sins forgiven before he gave him anything else. Now, the next verse in verse 6 says, Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And again, I can see those Pharisees and, and God saying in this verse that he can already see their hearts and he sees what they're saying. And the, the religious leaders that were in the room at that time questioning God questioning Christ in that situation and doubting him. So immediately he goes on and he goes, well, I'll show them. In verse 8 it says, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. You see, because of the Pharisees' disbelief, God takes it one step further. They couldn't see the, the change when God said, your sins are forgiven. So they said, you know, who can forgive sins but God alone? Because they couldn't see anything else. They just heard these words. You see in this story, one thing that, that really popped out to me as I read through this, what his friends did got him forgiven. But what his critics, his doubters, those spiritual leaders of the time, thought got him healed. So this passage tells us that those four men, they had faith. They knew if they could get him close to Jesus, that Jesus could heal him. But it also tells us that there's going to be adversity in our lives. There's going to be interruptions. There's going to be setbacks. But you never give up. You always push through. You've heard a little bit about my story. The last, for the last 20 years, I've been an evangelist. I've been able to travel around the world. I've got to see lots and lots of people come to know the Lord. It's been a huge blessing. About six months after I got saved... I was 32 years old. Things really started to happen for me in my life. About six months after that, I had an opportunity to fight in the upcoming UFC, the Ultimate Fighting Championships. I did fairly well. I uh, was put into a video game and had lots of other opportunities. And I was given an opportunity to compete shortly after that in the WWF. Do you guys remember when it was called the WWF, the World Wrestling Federation? They got sued by the World Wildlife Foundation a short time after that because <laughs> they had the name first. And they had to change it to the WWE, World Wrestling Entertainment. So I was in there through that transition. But as a, a brand new Christian, I was on fire for Jesus. It was so great. I had all these great big plans and all of these thoughts in my mind. Man, this is going to be such an amazing opportunity for me. I'm traveling around the world with Dwayne Johnson and John Cena and The Undertaker and 
Stone Cold Steve Austin and all these guys. I'm thinking, man, this is going to be great. I'm going to get all of these guys worshiping Jesus. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, we'll go into all these big arenas all around the world, you know, different cities and different states every single week. After our programs at night, we'll come back to the locker room and we'll have these little Bible studies together. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> it didn't take me long to realize that as a new guy on the, on the circuit and as a Christian that it didn't always work the way that I had planned in my mind. I felt like I had a big target on my back. I felt like I was getting attacked from the enemy at every single corner that I turned. And it didn't take me long to realize that this isn't, this isn't the picture that I had and this isn't where I was supposed to be at this time in my life. I lasted about two years traveling around with these guys before God shut that door. The Bible tells us that the enemy prowls around like a, a roaring lion waiting to devour. And oftentimes I, I felt like I was about ready to get devoured in that atmosphere. Revelations 3.7 tells us when the Lord opens a door, no one can shut it. But when he shuts it, no one can open it. I think looking back at, at that time that I spent in that chapter of my life, I was trying to open a lot of my own doors. I had this beautiful picture of my life and where it was headed and exactly what was going to happen and when it was going to happen. Have any of you ever tried to, to plan out your own path and open doors that probably weren't yours to open just to get met with some disappointment? Well, it wasn't long after that time, probably within weeks, that I was released from the WWE that God opened another door. I was introduced to this strength ministry, and they flew me down to Capel, Texas, and I met with a bunch of the directors and a couple of the members of the team. Well, they, they hired me and sent me out on my first crusade two weeks later. And man, it was amazing. I'm traveling around the world now, again with a bunch of great big athletes, some NFL football players, bodybuilders, powerlifters, world strongman competitors, a couple of Olympians, and it was just simply amazing. But I noticed something different about these guys right away. I noticed coming from the atmosphere that I just came from into this atmosphere, man, it was night and day difference. We would step into schools and all of a sudden these guys would call me into this big huddle and they'd we put our arms around each other and they would start praying for the school assembly for God's anointing to come over them. They would pray for each one of us individually. They'd pray for our families that were back at home and for our protection. I was just amazed at the difference and I knew immediately that, man, this was my path. This is where God wanted me to be. We would step into these schools and as you guys know today, we can't share our faith in the public schools. But it was amazing to step in front of these kids and get to talk about biblical principles and values. We would talk about the importance of academic excellence in our lives. We would talk about bullying. We would talk about peer pressure and share some, some personal stories with all of these issues. We would talk about the dangers of alcohol and drugs. And yes, we would talk about abstinence right in our public schools. And it was amazing to get to share these messages but at the end of those messages, we would invite them to come out to a nighttime performance where the church would, would bring us in for the week and then we'd hit all the surrounding schools. And at the nighttime performances, we got to share our faith. We got to share what God's done in our lives and what he can do in theirs. And it was amazing to see all these people come to know Jesus. Man, these new guys that I'm traveling around with, they didn't have egos or pride you guys know what ego stands for? Edging God out. And it was amazing just what was happening to me on the inside as I got to travel around the world with these guys. In just one year traveling around with these guys, we were able to see over 40,000 people walk to the front of the altar and give their lives to Jesus in one year. Unreal. 
But please know, out of those 40,000 that we saw come forward, I saved none of them. I don't have the ability to save. But you see, through the feats of strength that we did to draw a crowd, and more importantly, through the word of God, we were able to hold the rope long enough to get people close to Jesus and see them accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. Man, I knew this is where I belonged. And I'm so excited now for this new chapter in my life as I've been called to, to Grace Place and get to stand before your youth and get to share the word every single week. It was exciting just last week. I shared my very first message with the kids. I just want to let you know at the end of the service last week, we had 21 kids walk to the front of this altar and ask Jesus into their lives to be their Lord and their Savior. It was quite the, the first kickoff that, we, that I had, and it was uh, an amazing experience to see 21 kids give their lives to Christ just in the first week, and I'm excited about what God has for the rest of my time with these kids. I believe God works through the local church. He uses you and I for this. You see, when we take time to get others close to Jesus, God always does his part. We just need to figure out how we can hold the, ho hold the rope and get others close to him. I want to share a, a story about a guy that I was made aware of when I first joined Strength Ministry. There's a guy by the name of Bill Henderson. You see, Bill and his brother were friends of, or they were, they were part of this group called the Power Team, and it was before my time. It was in the late 70s, early 80s. They started to travel around with this group called the Power Team. Let's put a picture of Bill up on the, the screen. And you can see this is later in his, in his ministry. And he was serving with the power team at the time. But you see, this is a picture of, of Bill after he accepted Christ. But before Bill was saved, he was a pretty rough guy. He was part of a motorcycle gang, and they often said that he was one of the, the, the most violent, dangerous guys in the entire gang. He sold and trafficked drugs. He's one of those guys that you probably wouldn't want to run into in a dark alley. But in Luke 7, 47, the Bible tells us those who have been forgiven much love much. You see, Bill was walking down the street one day and he was handed a Bible track. And that Bible track radically changed his life. And he started winning people to Jesus immediately. He was on fire for the Lord. He, he joined the, the power team and started traveling around. And the guys told me that he would do this. He would, they would go into a restaurant, oftentimes after they would have one of their big events. He would clear off the table. He'd jump up on top of the table and he would scream at the top of his voice, emergency, emergency. If you die today, you don't know Jesus, you're going to hell. Well, that's it's not the way I do ministry. It's probably not the way you do ministry. But I'll tell you what, Bill was on fire for Jesus. And he was bold, uh, and he would share wherever he could. You see, Bill had a little daughter, and Bill's daughter's was, name was Jessica, and, and she would follow him around everywhere. She listened to his testimony over and over and over. She heard about his life of violence and how he was radically changed, and now he's traveling around sharing his testimony, winning people to Jesus. So Jessica does developed this same passion of sharing God's word and winning other people to Jesus. The two of them had developed this little tag team match where they would do this. They would go anywhere they could that had a captive audience. Oftentimes they did this in elevators where Bill would take his daughter and he'd prop her up on his shoulder and she was as small as Bill was big. She had this long curly blonde hair that was similar to his. But he'd put her up on his shoulder, and all of a sudden, she'd look down at her dad, and she'd say, Dad, should I tell him, or should you tell him? He'd look back up and say, I don't know, Jessica. Should I tell him, or should you tell him? 
She'd look back down. Should I tell him or should you tell him? Until people would finally say, would you just tell us? <laughs> and then Jessica would look back and she said, my daddy used to do dope deals, but now he does hope deals because he found Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And they would win people to Jesus right there in the elevator. They would be in the busy hotel lobby. Sure enough, the a lot of people that were gathered around, and he would prop her up on his shoulder. She would look down. Daddy, should I tell him or should you tell him? I don't know. Should I tell him or you should tell him? And finally, a crowd gathers, and she delivers her famous one line. My daddy used to do dope deals, but now he does hope deals because he came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And they would win people to Jesus in hotel lobbies everywhere they went. It was a short time after that Jessica became very ill. They didn't know what was going on with Jessica. They ran a series of tests. And they had determined that Jessica had a rare form of cancer. It wasn't long after that that she found herself lying in the hospital bed. Most of her long curly hair had fallen out. Her already thin body even more frail. She had her mom's hand on one side and her dad's hand on the other. And these are from the words of a child as she looked up. She said, Daddy, I hate the devil. The devil did this to me. Jessica closed her eyes and said, but by Jesus' stripes, I am healed. And she went to be on with the Lord. They said the nurses and the doctors rushed into the room they removed Jessica's mother and they took Jessica's body out shortly after and Bill found himself standing in the, the hospital room by himself. He realized he really didn't have a chance to say a proper goodbye to his little girl. So he wandered out into the hall and asked where they had taken his little girl's body. A nurse told him that they'd taken him down to a temporary morgue in the basement. Bill found his way to the elevator, went down to the lowest level he could go, went down a series of stairs that led down to the, to the morgue. As he walked in there, he said he saw a, a lady standing at the front of the door with her arms crossed. He said, ma'am, do you mind if I go in and, and say goodbye to my little girl? She shrugged her shoulders and said, yeah, go on in. She opened the door. And there as Bill walked in, he found his little girl lying on a cold metal table. He walked over to her, scooped her up, held her close, gave her a kiss on the cheek, and just above a whisper, said, honey, I love you. Tell Jesus I love him. Gave her another kiss, sat her back down on the cold table. When right then, right behind him, he heard a, a sound, he looked behind him and almost crying uncontrollably was the nurse that led him into the room that day. And in almost a scream, she pointed her finger and she said, sir, I don't understand. Your daughter is lying there on this cold table. She's dead. And yet you have so much peace. I don't understand, explain that to me. He looked back at the girl and said, ma'am, those who know Jesus weep not as those who have no peace. He grabbed the lady's hands and they talked for a short while. And right there in that morgue, as he's trying to explain this to this young nurse, he looks over at his daughter and he says, well, should I tell her or should you tell her? <laughs> they talked for a short while longer and right there in the cold basement morgue, that nurse knelt down on her knees and gave her life to Jesus. Let's put a picture of Jessica up there on the... You can't tell me that this little girl in her life and in her death, 
has figured out a way to hold the rope and get people close to Jesus. You can't give me a single reason why God can't use you. I'm gonna do something a little bit different this morning. If you guys would all just close your eyes and bow your heads. Would you think about that time in your life that you committed your life to Jesus? You've heard a little bit about my story, 32 years old, running from God my whole life. Didn't think that I needed God in my life. I could find my own path, find my own way. Took me 32 years to figure out it's impossible to say no to the things of this world until you first said yes to Jesus in your life. I remember that day like it was yesterday. I remember where I was, where I was sitting. I remember the emotions that I was feeling at the time. You may not know all of those exact things, but you should have a pretty good idea when that was in your life. When did you say yes to Jesus? When did you invite him into your heart? Repent of your sins. Think about that day. Think about that time in your life. I'm sure with a crowd this large, there are many of you that can't recall that time in your life. You don't know exactly when that was. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning. The same opportunity I had at 32 years old to ask Jesus into your heart. You see, when we stand before God, and we're all going to stand before God, on that day, we're going to hear one of two things. I know when I stand before the Lord, I'm going to see Jesus standing there with his arms wide open saying, welcome in, my loyal and my faithful servant. Because at 32 years old, I invited him into my heart, not just with my lips, but man, I meant that in my heart when I asked him into my life. But you know what? There's another, there's another sentence that you could hear on that day. I've had so many friends that tell me, Ron, I'm just not ready yet. I'm not ready to get my life right with God. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. It tells us that our time here on earth is like a mist. It's like a vapor when we compare that to all of eternity. When was that time for you? Where was that place? If you can't recall when that was, I'm gonna to count to three real quick and I just want you to slip your hand into the air and say, Ron, I want you to include me in that prayer today. But more importantly, Jesus, hear my prayer. I'm gonna to count to three. This isn't between you and the person you came with today. It's not between you and your wife or wife, you with your husband. This is between you and God this morning. Where was the time? When was the place? On the count of three, if you can't recall, let me include you in that prayer today. One, two, three. Put your hands up. I want you to know that you know that you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, and that you have a place in eternity with him for the rest of your life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want you, those of you that are asking God into your life for the very first time, to repeat this prayer after me, and I want everyone else that is, already has a relationship with Jesus to also repeat it. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, offering me salvation. For rising on the third day, proving that you are God. Today I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I repent of my sins. I turn my back on my past. And from this day forward, I will live for you and I will serve you every day of my life. Dear Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give the Lord a quick hand clap. There were many of you that made that decision today. Some of you raised your hand right here. Some of them went straight up. I believe there's probably a few of you in the room that didn't raise your hand, but you said that prayer for the first time today. I'm excited about that.
Can I tell you just real shortly, one of the most impactful things in my life, a day that I'll never forget is when I said that prayer. By far the best day of my life, better than stepping into any octagon or any ring, was the day that I got saved. And the pastor at the end of that service said, if you raised your hand, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to walk up to the front of the altar and I want you to not be ashamed of the decision that you just made. I had 500 people that were in the congregation that day. Everybody knew where I had been, knew what I had done. They had known my story. But you know what, when when the pastor gave me that opportunity, I was the first one out of my seat and down to the front of this altar. I'm gonna ask our prayer team to come forward at this time, some of the pastors, just to stand up front. And if you're still thinking to yourself, I can't do that, you really aren't understanding what you just did. Don't give Satan a stronghold. Don't let him start to get in your head and say, you know what, you didn't really mean that decision because I believe that you did. If you said that prayer for the first time, I'm gonna count to three one more time and I don't care where you're sitting, step out into the aisle, walk to the front and just let us say a, a prayer over you the best decision you've ever made in your entire life. The rest of the congregation is gonna clap louder than they've ever clapped. Here we go, one, two, three. Come on forward. Thank you, Jesus. Clap. If you said that prayer for the first time. Amen. Maybe right now, you've wandered away from Jesus and you want to rededicate your life, and you're feeling God pulling on your heart, walk forward right now. Let us pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else, God knows where you're at. Thank you, Lord. Wow. I want to say a quick prayer over those that made that decision today, that that walked forward to the front of this altar. Man, I know when I made that decision in my life, I felt like the weight of the world was lifted off of my shoulders as I took those 15 steps up here. And I say this all the time, but if you can't take 15 steps in a church to the front of the altar where people are going to love on you and pray for you, you'll never make it 15 steps minutes out there in the real world where you could be persecuted. Thank you, Lord. Bow your heads. Lord, thank you so much for those that had the courage to walk forward today. But more than that, Lord, the people that made a life-changing decision by asking you into their heart. Lord, we pray as they go back into their busy lives that people would see the change, people would see the difference in each one of these that made that decision today. You've changed their life forever, Lord. I pray that your plan for them is one that we can't even comprehend. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for these decisions. And we say this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Prayer team, you can take these people back. Let's give them one more big round of applause. Praise God. Tear off the roof of the kings in the house. Just give me to Jesus. I don't care how. I don't have to wait to get the healing. I got a faith without a seed. Tear off the roof of the 
nothing should get more excited than people's lives getting dedicated to Christ in this place. Yeah. Ron and I were talking about his sermon today, and uh, he was talking about hold the rope and all that. And I was like, oh, wait, is it about that story with the, the coming through the roof? Like, I literally picked a song out for that. So <laughs> it was a coincidental that we just threw it on the same week, right? No. Hey, I just want to give you guys some... Uh, outgoing announcements, things to put on your calendar because we have the Christmas holidays coming up. Who's excited about Christmas? Did you guys all pick up on my Christmas underscore when Clay talked about it? Anyways, um, inside jokes. Uh, the first week of December, we're doing our Bless the Babies. And every year we do this on the first week of December. So there's, there's obviously more than one way to grow a church. And we know there's some babies out there that need to get blessed. So that Sunday is the Bless the Baby Sunday, and then the next Sunday is our next Baptism Sunday. So both things that you can get signed up online through our Grace Place events page. And uh, otherwise, we got prayer partners in the back. If you guys need any prayer at all, go and get your prayer on, and we'll see you next week. Be blessed, everyone. Take care.